Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We have begun a new series in 1 Thessalonians. We had our first lesson last week, and so our second is this morning, beginning with verse 6 of chapter 1 through verse 10. At the end of the lesson last week, at the end of verse 5, Paul spoke to them of how they knew of the kind of men they proved to be, that they had been an example to them. They saw the kind of life that they had lived, speaking of Paul and his companions. And so now he says in verse 6, you also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you and how you turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven whom He raised from the dead, that is, Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, it's a great privilege to be with your people on this Sunday morning. It's a great privilege to gather with fellow believers and do this very thing. Read the scriptures together. Consider the meaning of the text together. We seek your help in doing that. We pray for light. We pray that you would illuminate our minds, give us an understanding of the text, and give us the proper application of it to our lives individually. And we look to you to bless. Uh, We can spend our time studying and preparing. A preacher can do that, and we can do that individually. But ultimately, the teacher is the Holy Spirit, and, and we look for his guidance and pray for it and give us discerning minds and bless us as we study together. And the end of this is not simply to gain knowledge, though that's very, very important, that's fundamental, but the knowledge is to give us a deeper relationship with you and a life of obedience and a life that brings glory to you. And we certainly have examples of that from these Thessalonians. So much of this passage is about their example. They followed good examples, they became good examples, and their example was uh, known widely, and what a great testimony that is. May that be the testimony of this assembly, and may that be the testimony of each one of us individually. So bless us, build us up in the faith. We pray that you would bless us spiritually. Feed us spiritually. Give us a greater understanding of yourself and your goodness and your grace and your mercy and your control over all the events of life. And we pray for the events of life that affect us. We pray for our material needs as well. We thank you for your generosity and your goodness to us and your mercy even in difficulties. And pray for those that are going through particular issues in life right now. Um, Those that are dealing with protracted health issues that just are nagging and don't seem to be resolved quickly. Give your people patience as they go through that. Uh, Give them healing. We pray for for Karis Ladwig that you would bless her as she continues to recover at home. Bless her. We thank of Cindy and we thank you for the mercy that was granted in the midst of a difficult fall and recognize things could be worse but you know she's in pain and difficulty and we pray that you give healing and comfort and, uh, and bless her in, uh, in her present situation. And others, Lord, who may be going through difficulty, bless and encourage 
We know that you control all things, and uh, yet we are reminded that how tenuous life is, how, how uncertain things are from our perspective, and we need to be looking to you constantly and thanking you for your goodness. And we thank you for bringing us here today and pray that you would bless us as a congregation, bless us through the time we spend in your word and as we sing the hymns of praise we pray that you would bless and we pray these things in Christ's name amen it is said that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery and that may be it can be the surest way of success depending of course on who or what a person is imitating that is important I stood in the Al-Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem 40 years ago during a call to prayer. I watched Palestinian men go through their prayers on the rich carpets spread on the floor. It's very involved. They stand, they bow, they go to their knees, they put their faces to the ground, then stand again. They repeat this ritual over and over as they recite their prayers. I noticed two small boys, kids, standing in the back trying to follow all of the moves. They wanted to be just like their fathers and uncles, so they eagerly imitated them and learned their religion. I've reflected on that scene of long ago and thought, that could have been me but for the grace of God. Learning a different way, following a different God, but light pierced the darkness of my heart years ago, put me on the right path, and gave me righteous models to imitate. And I should be doing that with all of the eagerness of a child. The Thessalonians were. That's how Paul describes them in verse 6. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord. And then he says, they became models for others to imitate. It was proof of what Paul said earlier in verse 4, that God had chosen them. How did he know that? He could see it in their lives, their profession and their behavior. Sovereign grace is the basis of election. And grace, that sovereign grace, produces action. It results in godliness. And the Thessalonians had that. They gave evidence of spiritual life. They took to Christianity immediately as demonstrated by their belief and behavior. Paul said, you also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. They became imitators because they knew, Paul said in verse 5, what kind of men we proved to be. That Paul and his friends were genuine. Their lives were consistent with the message that they preached. Their lives were consistent with the gospel, and that influenced the Thessalonians. Leon Morris wrote that while some today don't want attention for themselves, it yet remains true that no preacher can expect a hearing for his gospel unless it is bearing fruit in his own life. That's in his commentary, and he was writing probably with preachers mainly in mind because they're mainly the ones that would be reading his commentary, and what he's saying is certainly true, but really it's not just for preachers, it's for all of us. Every Christian must be bearing the fruit of the message that he or she professes in in their life. And the gospel bore fruit in the lives of the apostle and his friends. And the Thessalonians saw it and they imitated what they saw in them and they imitated Christ. Now you may have noticed the order here seems a little odd because it's they imitated Paul, then they imitated Christ. If that seems odd, it's really not because what 
Paul is doing here is he's really giving the historical order of things. They first saw Paul. They saw his life. And yet when they understood the gospel, they realized what they were seeing in him that they liked so much was Christ in him. That's what they admired. Some of you will have heard this, but uh, we have a missionary whose name must remain anonymous who illustrates this. Uh, he had been a Christian for about a year. And this is some 35 years ago, I think. When a friend invited him to go to the celebration of a missionary's 100th birthday taking place at Princeton. The missionary was Dr. William Miller, a godly man who spent most of his life ministering in Persia. At the celebration, he spoke, and our friend was greatly impressed by his words and his life. Later, he saw him walking across campus, and he wanted to speak to him, but he didn't know what to say. And so he spoke what was on his heart. He ran up to him and said, Dr. Miller... I really like you. And the missionary very graciously corrected him. He said, you don't like me. You love the one who lives in me. And that was true. Christians are in Christ like a branch in a vine. His life is in us. And the more we imitate him, the more of him people see in us and the more attractive we become, and the more effective we become as Christians. Christ is our example. He is our Savior. We are not saved by living His life. In fact, if that were the way of salvation, that would be an impossible path. Salvation would be denied to all of us because He is perfect. But having believed in Him, we have been placed in Him by the grace of God, and He is in us, and we can imitate Him. Not perfectly, of course, but we are to do that. He is our law. He is our rule of conduct. He's our great example. Salvation is of grace. It is a gift. And the complete grace of it, the greatness of the grace of it, is indicated in the next statement where Paul says, they received the word in much tribulation. Now that word received has the idea of welcome, as in welcoming a guest. In fact, it's used that way in Luke chapter 10, verse 8, when the Lord sent His disciples out to go to various villages and places. And when they entered these villages, uh, they would be received into homes. That's the word that's used. They would come and those people who lived there would or would not receive them into their homes. The gospel, the word that the Thessalonians believed, was received by them like receiving a guest. They didn't invite the missionaries, Paul and his friends, to come to Thessalonica. They weren't expecting it. They arrived, they came, and unexpectedly, but they gladly invited that message that they heard into their hearts. Paul says they did it in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Joy in tribulation. That's not expected. That's unusual. So this is no easy thing. Their life was no easy thing. Their reception of that gospel was no easy thing. Not like pliable, merrily leaving the city of destruction with Christian and excited all the way, wanted to talk about the glory to come and the, the blessings of the kingdom to come and of heaven. And he, he was so excited about all the wonderful things that he was about to experience when they fell into the slew of despond, or the British call it the slough of despond. So... Maybe that's the better way. And then, you know, he manages to climb out of that. He's covered in muck and mire, and he's so angry, and this was not what he was expecting, and he turned back and went home to the city of destruction, never to take that path again. Well, the Thessalonians began in the slough. There was strong opposition to the gospel from the beginning. 
fact, Paul had been driven out of town. The verb that corresponds to the word tribulation is used of trampling on grapes in winemaking. So, so the image is one of extreme hardship, not mere discomfort. The, the Jews opposed Paul aggressively. They ran him out of town. In fact, they even pursued him down to Berea and drove him out of there. And they would not tolerate converts in Thessalonica. They made life hard for that young church. And it wasn't just the, the Jewish people there. It was the civil authorities as well. They were in a very difficult situation. So by the time that Paul wrote this letter, the faith of the Thessalonians had been tested and tried severely. But they'd handle it well with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Everyone suffers to some extent. This is a fallen world. And so we're going to have difficulties. We're going to trip when we're walking. We're going to do things like that. We're going to have trials in our life. But what we're talking about here, what Paul is describing here, is suffering for the faith. I haven't suffered for the faith anything to the degree these people did or those Jewish believers in the book of Hebrews did, losing property, being jailed. But the New Testament treats it as a privilege and speaks of it as sharing in the sufferings of Christ. When the apostles left the Sanhedrin, this is recorded in Acts chapter 5, after being beaten, the second time they'd been brought before that high court. This time, they didn't get off with just a warning. Then they were beaten, and I'm sure beaten severely. But as they left, they were rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to, sh to suffer shame for His name. Paul told the Philippians that it has been granted, gifted, given, Granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. Believing the gospel is a gift. It is granted. Faith doesn't originate with us, but with Him, with the Holy Spirit. Now, don't misunderstand me. Every believer truly believes. He or she exercises his or her mind and will, understands, knows what it is, trusts in Christ. That's a personal act of the individual, but only because the work of the Spirit of God in that person to quicken the mind, to give ears to hear, eyes to see, and move the will. It's all a work of God. It is a gift. That is clearly taught in Scripture, and we like that. I think we like that here. We should. It's biblical, but so is suffering. And that's what Paul is saying here it, to the Philippians. It too is granted. It too is a gift. Uh, maybe some of us don't suffer much for Christ because we've not been seen to be worthy enough to do it. That's sort of the application I make to myself when I see this. It's always unpleasant. It's never something that we seek, but it is considered a privilege. I don't want to be glib uh, about this subject. Suffering is hard, especially when it's protracted, when it's over time and it just continues. Uh, it, it had worn down those, those saints of the book of Hebrews. In fact, they had gone through it so long and it had been so severe and they lost so much that they were thinking about leaving the church to return to the synagogue. That's the reason the book was written, to tell them, no, you can't do that. But they were in need of strong encouragement, and that's why that book is characterized by exhortation, by encouragement. And, and really, the source of joy in the midst of trials is the Holy Spirit. That's what we see here with the, whole, with the Thessalonians. They had joy, but it was the joy of the Holy Spirit, which is to say it's supernatural. So again, what we see is the Christian life is a supernatural life. It's the work of the Spirit within us, and, and that explains them. 
Now, he's praising them for their response and what they were doing. But it's the Spirit of God that supplies the faith and the perseverance and the strength and the joy and all of that. But from a person's perspective, from their perspective, from our perspective, that joy is produced in us through understanding, realizing that we are suffering for the gospel. We are suffering in the place of Christ. And that, if we understand it, gives joy. Having the right perspective is what's necessary. And they had it. So they rejoiced. And Paul's point of encouragement for them was that all of this, their reception of the gospel and tribulation, their suffering with joy, their belief and behavior were all proofs of their divine election. And it was not only proof to Paul, it was proof to a lot of people. The Thessalonians had a wide audience. A lot of people were watching them and were impressed. In verse 7, Paul tells them that they had become an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. The imitators were in turn imitated. That happens when we are obedient. When we walk by the Spirit, when we live in obedience to God's Word. Macedonia was the region in the northeast section of Greece where the churches of Philippi and Berea and Thessalonica were located. Achaia is the south uh, from Corinth west. So all the churches of Greece were watching the Thessalonians. They'd become an example to them. So the imitators became the imitated. And that's as, as it should be. And I think perhaps we have something of a, uh, an application here. This would be a good place to make it. You don't know who's watching you. You don't have any idea the kind of influence you may be having on others. These people had no idea that people all the way in southern Greece were aware of what was taking place. And, and as Paul explains, it goes, it goes beyond that. Paul called the, uh, the Christians in Macedonia and Achaia believers because that was the distinctive mark of the Christian for the apostles. Not social service, not social justice. Those, all those things certainly have their place, but the mark of the Christian was faith. It's belief in the gospel. Christians engaged in a lot of social service and some of it remarkable as you study the early church and certainly they showed love for one another, and particularly these Thessalonians would have done that in the midst of this uh, very hostile environment and the persecution that they were experiencing. And Jesus, you know, as he said in John 13, verse 35, stated that love for one another is the mark of the Christian. That's how the world will know that we are his disciples if we have love one for another. They imitated Paul and his companions, faithful, obedient, godly servants, and they, they demonstrated the reality of their faith in their good conduct, in their love for one another, their love for others. But what especially characterized the Thessalonians was their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as God's eternal Son and their Savior, and their perseverance in that faith. Their continuance in that faith in the midst of hostility. That's what Paul states in verse 8, where he expands on the impression they made. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, and you know, it's as amazing as that is, that it in the, sh in the short time had spread throughout Greece, but he says... Uh, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth so that we have no need to say anything. We don't need to talk to people about what we did, how we were received when we came to Thessalonica. Everybody knows it. That's what he's saying. They were preachers of the gospel, these Thessalonians, and they were located in a favorable place for that on the Via Ignatia one of the great highways of the Roman Empire. 
Thessalonica had a harbor, so they had access to people coming and going from all parts of the empire. And from there, Paul said, the word of the Lord had sounded forth. That's the gospel, the word of the Lord. It is God's word to the lost. It's God's word to the world, to kings and slaves, to merchants and philosophers, to all kinds of people. Christ is God become man. He is the Savior, and there is life in Him for all who believe. The gospel is that simple, and that's what the Thessalonians preached, but they not only preached it, they lived it. They lived their faith. But very importantly, they declared their faith in a hostile environment. They had courage. The effect of their evangelism, Paul said, was that he and his friends had no need to say anything about their mission to the city. Everyone knew. He said in verse 9 that everywhere they went, people told him uh, about the kind of reception that they got. Told Paul about the kind of reception Paul and the others got there in Thessalonica and what happened to the believers there how they were transformed. They were impressed by what happened to the people of Thessalonica who had put their faith in Christ. How you turned, Paul said, to God from idols to serve a living and true God. Now that tells us something very important about becoming a Christian. It involves a definitive break with the past. Upon conversion, a person's life is reoriented. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, Paul wrote, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. The fact is, uh, every believer is a new creature in Christ. The fact is that when we put our faith in Christ, when we're regenerated, when we're placed in Christ, a real change has occurred. We are new people, and therefore we are to live up to what we are and not cling to what we were. We can no longer be the people we once were because we're not those people anymore. And for those early Christians, that the change started with religion. The first century was a religious age. It was a pagan age. But it was a world filled with religion, of polytheism, of temples and idols. The apostles' attitude toward it was what one writer called militant hostility. That's pretty strong. They, they would not have tolerated the syncretism today found in Latin America, for example, where parts of Christianity are mingled with the old paganism of the indigenous people. That's not Christianity. The Thessalonians made a complete break with the past. The Christians of Ephesus did the same. When revival occurred there, Luke account, recounts in Acts 19 how they got rid of everything of the black arts and occult. People came to Paul and confessed their practices, and they burned their books. It was a great book burning. The, I don't know, the, or the original bonfire of the vanities. It was a complete break with the pagan past in Thessalonica as well. And, and it must be the same in our day. Now, what are the idols that we have? Well, they're not statues of Jupiter. They're other things. An idol is whatever takes God's place in your life. Paul defined idolatry in Colossians 3, verse 5, as greed, the love of money. We can understand that. And it, it can be anything, though. It can be the, the overwhelming, driving desire for prestige. Or uh, it can be something as good as a love of family. Or and not something as innocuous as entertainment. It can go on with a list of things that can be uh, idols. In some parts of the world, of course, 
this idea of idols is, is to be taken literally. But in the West, it's, it's different. America and Britain and Europe are living in a very, very secular age. And there are lots of buildings in these, I'm thinking particularly of Europe, that uh, have steeples, but they don't have, they're not churches. We have that in our, in our country as well, but there it's gone to the, the, uh, the, the, the level where these buildings are no longer even used as churches. Um, the Wall Street Journal did a report on this some uh, years ago, back in 2015. I, I'm sure it's gotten worse since then, but the, the church buildings in Europe are abandoned, and they've been turned into various things like boutiques or bars or, oh, I remember one account was of uh, a skateboard hall. Many of those. As I read that and thought about it, I thought, well, it's just as well. Christ wasn't there anyway. He doesn't share his place with idols or air of any kind. And so those things have gone away. He's left and those kind of churches die anyway. So this is the, where the Thessalonians were. The, they were in a pagan society. They had believed in paganism. And what did they do? They left it. They turned to God from serving idols. And we too, as Christians, whatever the idols are in this secular age we have, not the idols that those men and those women face, but we have to leave those as well, whatever they may be. That means some personal examination, but that's part of Christianity. But it's not the only part. The negative is not the only part. There's also the positive, and I think that's the main part. It is turning from and turning to. And mainly, as I, I would describe it, it's mainly a turning to. It is turning to what they turn to, a living and true God. He's real. He's living. An idol, as Paul told the Corinthians, is nothing. Nothing more than a piece of stone and a false idea. Psalm 115 described idols as having mouths that cannot speak, eyes that cannot see, ears that cannot hear, hands that can't feel, and feet that can't walk. In other words, they can't do anything. They're worthless. They're no help. They can't carry you. Well, neither can... Our big bank accounts help in the great crises of life. When death comes, it's no help. But God does. He's alive. He's the only God. He is real and He can help. He has ordered everything in heaven and earth. And those who serve Him are blessed, even in the midst of difficulty. They are blessed. The Thessalonians had knowledge of Him. They understood who He is. They had theology. They had truth. And as Jesus said in John 8, verse 32, the truth will make you free. Meaning that the, the truth of God's Word frees us. And with real freedom. The knowledge of who God is frees us when we believe it. So... Really, turning from idols is natural because the truth gives the lie to everything that is false. And those Thessalonians, they saw it. Their eyes, spiritual eyes, were open to it. So when they saw the truth, it was the natural thing for them to do to turn to the Lord God and from their false idols. When, when a person is regenerated, when a person has eyes to see and ears to hear, and they see the truth of it, it is natural and instantaneous that they believe. And that was the case with these men and women of Thessalonica. When they saw the truth, they repented of the false. When they did that, they gained new life and real hope, a victorious, glorious future, 
They were waiting for Christ, Paul says in verse 10. They were anticipating the, the Lord's return. That's a, a major subject in both, both First and Second Thessalonians, eschatology, the, the study of the final things. It is a major subject and doctrine of the New Testament. Leon Morris wrote that the doctrine of the Lord's return is mentioned most, frequent, most frequently of all the doctrines of the New Testament. I'm just quoting him here. He wrote that there is a reference to it on the average once every 13 verses from Matthew right through to Revelation. At least he wrote, so I am told. Well, he may not have counted it all up, but if what he was told is correct, and that is a high frequency of times that the return of the Lord is mentioned. And what it shows is this is a major doctrine. This is something that should not be ignored. It should not be trivialized. It's our hope, the return of the Lord. We have a living Savior. He was raised from the dead, Paul says. He is alive. He has ascended into heaven. He is there now, ministering for us now. But He's coming again. Christ's resurrection is the proof that His Father accepted His sacrifice for us, that atonement was made for us, forgiveness was gained, and we have been saved from the penalty of sin. His return is based on His sacrifice, on the success of His sacrifice, and it will complete the salvation that He, ob he obtained for us at the cross. That's when, Paul says... He rescues us from the wrath to come. But what does Paul have in mind when he writes of the wrath to come? I think we naturally think of hell. But that's not the reason he's coming again to save us from hell. He did that at the cross. Here his rescue of us is connected to his return. And the, the participle rescues can be translated, who will deliver us. And if we take it that way, he's looking to the future. But rescue us from what? I think the answer to that is given in chapter 5, where in verse 9, Paul uses the same word, wrath, to say, God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 5 is about the calamities of the future that will come in what is called the day of the Lord. The judgments that God will pour out on the world in the last days. And Paul wrote there that men will be saying, peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly. And that's the day of the Lord. But it will be surrounded by, preceded by men who are saying, yep, peace and safety, all is well. Now that's very similar to what took place in the Old Testament. That's similar to the false prophets that Jeremiah dealt with and that Isaiah dealt with. And Jeremiah wrote of these men who said in his day, peace, peace. But he said there is no peace. And the reason he said there is no peace is because judgment was coming. God had revealed that to him. And events proved him true when the Babylonians laid waste to Judah and destroyed Jerusalem and took the people off into captivity. Jeremiah called that wrath and great anger. That's what Paul is describing in chapter 5. Worldwide calamity that God will cause on the earth as judgment. The eschatological judgment described in the book of Revelation. In fact, at the end of Revelation chapter 6, after the sixth seal is broken, men cry out in terror for the mountains and rocks to hide them from God and the Lamb, for, they say, the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? It's the same word for wrath used here in verse 10. So, while hell is real and believers are delivered from it, that doesn't fit the context of the book, which is the wrath of the day of the Lord. 
The rescue of Christ that Paul is referring to here is the rescue from that terrible day of judgment. We have not been destined for that. The world has, and it will go through that, but we will be delivered from it. Well, how will that happen? In the rapture of the church that's described later in chapter 4 and verse 17, when the trumpet will sound and the saints will be caught up into the clouds to meet Christ in the air. Now that is the hope that the Thessalonians had and that Paul had taught them in the the two or three weeks that he was there with them in Thessalonica. And he, he later speaks of their knowledge of these things in chapter 5. But he would teach them more here in this book and encourage them with the hope that we have. Paul knew that they needed that. They needed encouragement. Persecution produces discouragement. It, it, it grinds people down. So much of this book is to encourage those Thessalonian saints. It was to urge them on in their faith. It was to urge them to be watchful. They were being that. They were waiting for God's Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead. And that very description of of Christ is full of encouragement. God raised Him from the dead. So again... We have a living Savior who's coming for us. It wasn't very long before Paul wrote those words that that he was in Athens, where the Athenian wise men, remember the philosophers, listened to him with some interest until he spoke of the man that God had appointed to be judge, spoke of Jesus Christ whom God raised from the dead, And when they heard about this judgment that was coming and this one who'd been raised from the dead, they mocked him. They laughed at him. The very idea of a resurrection was folly in their thinking. Well, that didn't shake Paul at all in his confidence because he knew that Christ is alive now. That He will come and rescue the saints and then judge the world when it is confidently speaking of peace and safety. And so with that hope of the future and the the present reassurance that they had of the living Savior who watches over them, who prays for them, prays for you, prays for us as His people in the trials of life and the trials they were going through and you go through, That was encouraging to them to stay steadfast in the midst of it. And what greater example could there be than steady saints in times of trouble? Now that is surely when the world really takes notice of the church and asks, why do you live like that? How are you able to do that? Being steady, persevering through the trials of life is one of the great times of being a witness and an example to those around us, to fellow believers, but to the world as well. That happened to uh, the, the Persian missionary, Dr. Miller, I mentioned earlier, when a Muslim cleric in his village who had rejected all contact with him because he was an infidel, witnessed something outside his window that truly affected him. He saw in the street children taunting him, and one threw a rock that hit Dr. Miller in the head and drew blood. But instead of reacting in anger, he put his arms around the child and embraced it. And the cleric was amazed as he saw that. And so this man who had cut off all contact with Dr. Miller set up a meeting. He met with him and he asked him why he did that. And Dr. Miller said, because I follow someone who teaches me to love my enemies and pray for them. That led to a relationship between the two that resulted in the Muslim cleric's conversion and a whole other story of his wide influence in Persia a hundred years ago. Our example matters. Matters. 
That's what we need to be. An example to others. An example in our home to our family. A a loving and godly father or mother to our children. A diligent employee that others want to imitate and is a blessing to the employer. We can go down a list of all of the different areas of life where we must be an example. And who knows who's watching? And who can say how wide your influence is? I'm no, I don't doubt that when the Thessalonians read this, they were amazed that they had such a wide influence. And so it will be with those of you who begin to live truly in a, with a desire to imitate the apostle to imitate Christ. We will do that when we imitate him and when more of Christ is seen within us. Uh, And what do we see when we look at Christ? One who went about doing good, one who was so devoted to the mission and obedience to his father that he laid down his life for his people, for his church. And that's the kind of people we'll be a sacrificing, self-sacrificing people. May God help us to think like that, to desire that, to think about the future and know that we have hope that the world does not have. The Lord will come. The Lord will rescue us. We're to live in light of that and we are to live faithfully in the meantime and be imitators of Christ. If you're here without Him, we invite you to come to Him who forgives and transforms lives with new life, eternal life, who will put you on the right path, on the clean path that leads to eternity. He'll put you on glory road. Come to Him. Believe in Christ and be saved. And then, by God's grace, be imitators of Paul, be imitators of Christ, be an example to those around you. Let's stand and sing a hymn. I sing out of the red book this time, number 104, Come Thou Found, and then remain standing for the benediction. Father, we confess we, uh, we are debtors to grace, debtors to mercy. And we thank you for your grace and mercy that have been extended to us. We who have believed in Christ, we thank you that From all eternity, you chose us to be your children. You sent your Son into the world to purchase us and your Spirit to gather us. And by your grace, we are in your family and we have a glorious future. We may face trials in this life. We certainly will, to some degree, give us the strength to be faithful in the midst of them. Give us the vision of you and your love for us to strengthen us in that resolve. And that, in fact, to have joy in the midst of it, as those Thessalonians did. We'll have that to the degree we understand your grace and your love for us. We thank you for it. Thank you for all that we have in Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you.